the best players in the world are trying to be as weak as humanly possible when they get very close to the green. They're not trying to add speed. They're not trying to add strength. They're not trying to add anything crazy and put a whole bunch of zip on that ball. They want to lob that ball towards the green and let gravity and the roll take care of itself. When your swing for your short game gets, I don't feel too comfortable about it, go up a notch. Go up to the next club, even if it's your pitching wedge. Open the face a little bit and try and see how long you can recreate. You can open your nine iron. There's no rules out there, but if you've got that great little chipping swing and you're like, this is money, I could do this all day long, find out how many clubs you could do it with. And if you have a sticking area, look to the club, check your ego, make your technique one that mimics that comfort you have if you're five yards from the green to go, I can chip this. Golf Smarter, number 738. Now's the best time to work on your weaknesses with PGA Master Professional Joe Hallett. This is Golf Smarter, sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Joe. Fred, how are you? It's been a while, but boy, it's good to hear your voice again. And you know, uh, I am so glad to have you back. It's, you want to talk about a while? You were episode number nine of Golf Smarter. So actually, the last time we talked was 2006. <laughs> I mean, it was just after we started the podcast. And then when I started Golf Smarter Mulligans, you were episode number two. So obviously your content is very strong, and I deeply apologize for not having you back on the show. But I'm glad I found you. I, I'm, I'm glad it's not a video one because my hair color has gone from something to gray to white. And as long as I still have hair at this point after spending all those hours on the lesson tee, I'm happy. So with this shelter in place that we're struggling with here in California, I'm wondering how many bald guys are going to get the last laugh because <laughs> we're, my hair is just, I, it's in Hatville, man. And it's, it makes my hat stand really <laughs> tall because it just keeps growing and there's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> oh, Lord. Oh, oh man. So uh, you're in the Nashville area, Nashville, Tennessee area, and you have had beyond this pandemic, you guys, you were, had some pretty nasty weather that scared oh, everybody man. in sight all during it's this, just, right? Yeah. And amongst everything, golf has become a kind of a bastion to at least get away from things and, you know, get some, as they call it, essential recreation, but to kind of get your mind off of things. But, you know, I'm, I am the I am the furthest thing from a musician that you will ever meet in your entire life. I mean, the, the cowbell seems complicated to me, but <laughs> I mean, this community and the music community, they have literally put everything together. And it just I mean, it's kind of getting the double punch, but we're doing it. We're we're out there. A lot of people out on the golf course walking. And, you know, I mean, I know it's a little timely of what's going on in this particular thing. But, you know, I I don't know how many golfers you know, Fred, but I can assure you 99.9% .9 of the golfers I know do not hit it within six feet of each other ever, even on the green. So that social distancing seems to be pretty easy. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that I loved about when this was all starting is I felt comfortable that golf was going to be okay. Um, and I actually just put up a video of our last round that we played. My buddy Neil and I played before the day before they shut the state down. Um, and I, golf is perfect. You know, you're, you, if you're walking, you don't have to touch other people's stuff. You're wearing gloves. You're always at least six feet apart from one another. It, it's a, to me, it's a, an essential business and it's good for your head. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and the, the gimme range has stretched out a little bit to almost six feet now. So that's perfect with me. That's got four strokes off my game. It, forget inside the, the leather. It's now inside the flag. Right. Yeah, but you don't perfect. touch the flag. Don't touch the flag. <laughs> <laughs> but if you laid the flag down, if you laid the stick down and it's inside the flag, you're good. I like that. Pick idea. it up and go. Pick it up oh. and go. Oh, man. Um. There's there's lots of topics I'd love to cover with you. I want to start it with um, 
the future of golf and why statistics are becoming so important to not to the to the tour but to the the recreational golfer like myself why do i need to pay attention to my statistics how's that going to help me hit the ball in the middle of the fairway well and for, this is the coolest part and you know you go back to that movie uh with uh Brad Pitt and uh Jonah Hill Moneyball That's, and you hey my Oakland A's man and, and you know what it's because I think in the past, everybody kind of kept control of how many times did I hit the ball in the fairway? How many greens in regulation did I hit? Well, how many putts did I have? And your only comparison data really was, well, I hit two greens today and Tom Watson averaged 12 for the last 10 years of his career. So I got a little bit of work to do. Yeah. But what they've started to do, and it's kind of seeped down from the tour into the collegiate area and from the collegiate, now it's into the junior area. And what it is, is like, how do you get to that next level? So all of a sudden, you've got these companies that are out there that start tracking data, and they help you so many different ways. And boy, you want to talk about boring. I mean, just talking about statistics, looking at them is horrible, but talking about them. But the concept is this. If I'm a really good college player and I want to get onto the tour, here's where I am. What are those guys doing? And what am I missing? Is it a magic shoelace that I'm not using right? Or is it, do I have the wrong grips on my club? And you start to find out some things that are very, very interesting. And then all of a sudden, that high school kid that wants to play college, now they have comparison. So you can kind of go, I want to play at a D1 school. Okay, well, here's the data and here's the numbers of greens these guys are hitting, how many putts they average, how many times they get up and down. So now and you go, okay, well, what about a D2 school? Oh, okay, well, that's more where I am now. So they can have some comparison. And when you start looking at that and you get back to high school, it isn't even about competitive golf anymore. Now you're starting to look at scoring ranges. Like, I'm shooting in the 90s. What do I need to do better to shoot in the 80s? And that kind of leads into, I think, what we're going to talk a little bit further is about, you know, like, why should you go take lessons? But now you have something you can tell your pro. I need to get better here. And there is some of the stupidest stuff out there you would never, ever believe. And I'm going to give you a stat. We just did something. Uh, there's a, a group out there called GameForge. Awesome guy. The guy that invented uh, Aimpoint and Brian Bailey put this together. And they've been tracking a lot of that. First of all, they do two really cool things. One is they were tracking the data. And they did a webinar the other day for I'm a Symmetra Tour player and I want to get on the LPGA. You know what? You looked at the basics and they go, I'll be darned. You both drive the ball about the same distances and you hit about as many of the same fairways. Okay, I'll be darned. You hit about as many greens on both tours. The numbers started literally lining up all the way down and then you found two that were very different. And one of them was par fives. On the LPGA Tour, the ladies that are making the cut over two days are averaging minus 3.8 on par five. So they're almost four under on the par fives. Wow. On the Symmetra Tour, they're even par. Mm. So all of a sudden you go, and now, but now they have an avenue to go in. Am I not playing aggressively enough? Are my wedges not very good? Should I hit the ball further off the tee? And here's the one that really blew me away. And this is almost on both tours, but specifically on the LPGA. They have what they want to call your third shot. So for most of us, we're talking about a chip. Let's just call it a chip shot, okay, on a sure. par four. Sure. The number is almost spooky. The ladies on the LPGA tour chip the ball within not three feet, six feet of the hole, 50% of the time. Wow. The ladies on the Symmetra we're at 39 percent we're not talking i don't mean we're not talking close but we're talking six feet that's an accomplishable objective so now as the average player you go well i don't know if i can play on that but i think i could chip the ball within six feet go do that see what you did on your last 10 chips and you might find you know sometimes when we play this game it's a little more fun if we have a peach basket <laughs> instead of a <laughs> a thimble to try and hit the ball into but something as simple as that, and you, and you think there's no way that this can be, you know, it's, and you could see the results of some of the players going, my gosh, 
Is my chipping that bad that 50% of the time I'm not chipping the ball within six feet and it's taken for granted? And uh, so all the stuff that's coming out in like this particular program, not only that, once you put all the scores and whatever else, which takes about 55 seconds at the end of a round, it starts prescribing things for you to practice on and it gives you games and challenges and different tests to test yourself with. And it keeps track of how you're doing in the practice games and how you're doing in the tests. And the funniest part is there's that, what do they call it now? Artificial intelligence in the background. <laughs> yeah. So, so let's literally say okay, I'm boomer. struggling. <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah. What do they call it? Yeah. Artificial. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was rude. Go ahead. <laughs> it, it, no, it's exactly right. But you know, in the background, what it's doing, let's, let's just take randomly. And then I'll kind of finish up on this to show you something about how cool this is. Uh, let's say randomly you and I have to practice our three foot putts and we go out and the drill is how many can you make out of 10? Well, let's say we make nine out of 10 and the computer and the program looks and goes, gosh, you're pretty good at this. Nine out of 10, that's 90%. We'll take that. It's also watching your score because if your score doesn't change, it goes, well, that's a useless drill. It doesn't make a difference in the score. Let's try something else. So you could be real good at practice and not be real good at the game. And the way these stats programs are now, they're helping you actually devise your practice so it actually does influence your game out there. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but you know what I'm saying? It's like, I don't get it. I make 10 out of 10 every time in the putting green and the computer goes, well, good for you. You still stink out on the golf course. You need to try a different sort of practice. And it'll come up with different forms of practice for that same thing. Maybe 10 with your eyes closed. Maybe 10 with your left hand only. Maybe 10 on one leg. You know, just to kind of see. And that, now you're into all that neural pathway. And that's way above my pay grade, my good friend. I promise you. But it's, it's, it's looking and going, I know you're practicing, but is it making a difference? And you might go, no, it's not. Then you're not practicing the right way or the right stuff. Now, I got to tell you something that's really funny, and you're going to have to visualize this for a second. All right? Yeah. They ran this data, and it's called in position. And in position is basically, can I hit a shot and then hole out my next one? All right. So could you imagine the PGA Tour, if you took all of those guys on tour, all of them, from 1 to 10 yards, their in positions are 100%. You put a tour player 10 yards away, he's going to hit a shot and hole the next one. Simple, right? Sure. From 300 yards, from 300 yards, they're zero. That's a one in a million. Okay. So the whole graph kind of has a little downwards, you know, the closer you are, they're at 100% and it kind of gradually, and it follows a nice gradual descent down to zero because nobody's yanking out their driver at 300 yards and making the putt the next time. Mm, well, unfortunately, no. Yeah. There was a guy out there last year and I saw his data. He followed the chart all the way down. And somewhere between 40 and 60 yards for the entire season, his conversion rate between 40 and 60 yards was 0%. Zero. This guy didn't make one up and down between 40 and 60 yards. Wow. His name was Tiger Woods. Whoa. Now, uh, put this in front of a short game guy, and you know what he does? He goes, yeah, but how many shots did he have from there all year? Out of the uh, 300 and however many he had, you know how many he had? Six. Yeah. He avoids that area like the plague. I mean, but so he wait, knows. He was 0 for 6? Is that the stat? Mm -hmm. Is that what we're saying? He's just 0 for yeah. 6? So that's not a big enough oh. sample size. No, well, but those, he only hit six shots all year between 40 and 60 <laughs> yards. So that tells you <laughs> he knows where he's trying to put that ball. If, if he was between 40 and 60, he probably had to pitch something out of the rough or had to do, but man, you, you look at him between 10 and 40 really and you look at him between 60 and a hundred, he's way above the curve. He's playing to his strengths. That's where these guys are starting to use this data and go, look, I either got to get better there or I just don't hit the ball there. And tiger, what a year he had last year, wow. but you, you look and you, you look at another stat and the guy literally mimics the line all the way down. It's Matt Kuchar. He's a human ATM machine. I mean, he, he just follows. But stuff like that has become really interesting because now they can take that. And you don't have to compare yourself to tour pros. You can compare yourself to, is your handicap between 5 and 10, 10 and 15, 15 and 20? 
And it's really going to help players a lot. You don't have to necessarily get better in every area. Play to your strengths. Awesome. We're going to take a quick time out, and then I, want to, I have a follow-up question about that. But we'll be right back. Joe, in, in talking about these statistics and you're learning that from 40 to 60 yards, you have zero success rate or anything over 30 yards. I mean, now we're now let's not talk about Tiger. Let's talk about us again. That, you know, 30 yards. What, what, one of the, what are we practicing that's not correct? Or well, let me ask it this way. What should we be practicing? Because we tend to go to the driving range and practice what we're good at. And that we still leave these huge holes in our scorecard because we can't get up and down. And people are trying to, you know, get the ball to loft and drop set, you know, right near the hole and stop. And they're surprised that it released because they're hitting from the rough. You know, it, it, so many times I've heard teachers talk about get the ball onto the green as soon as you can and just let it roll. Right. And people are still trying to fly it onto the green from not very far away. What, and it brings me back to this question, and I'm sorry for making it such a long one, but how are we going to practice the things we're not good at? And that's, you know what, that is, first of all, that's the hardest thing to do. Because you a number one, especially if you're a good player and you're with your teammates, or you're a weekend player and you're out on the range, Pulling out that club that you know you only hit solid one out of every seven shots, you, you need to learn to go ahead and check your ego at the door or go to the farthest end of the range if it's going to bother you that, you know, you're hitting hosel rockets and tops and chunks. and So check your ego at the door is number one. Number two, potentially with the onslaught of all the different wedges, all the different combinations of bounces and sole designs, Find out the club that, especially for whatever your area is, find out the club that is the most forgiving. Look, it's, again, you got to check your ego. You go, well, I have the Vokey 60-degree wedge and the Callaway uh, Mac Daddy grooves. And what's that other thing? That's a 17-wood. That's my club I use between 25 and 35 yards. At the end of the day, look, they're going to laugh at you when they see your 17-wood in there or whatever it is, and they go, you know, you should chip with that thing all the time because you can find a club because a lot of times there's a difference in the length of the swing and the effort. And if you had to ask me as an instructor, where do most players start to struggle when they're somewhere between this is not an easy chip shot. I got to put a little bit of effort into it. And when you start adding that in that effort, unless you practice it all the time, that effort is, oh, do I do I swing faster? Do I take it back longer? Do I put a little movement in it and you know and when you don't practice it a lot you you kind of go through your structure and you go well i'll swing this one longer well that one higher and shorter no okay i'll swing this faster that one higher longer over the green now so look at check your ego look at your equipment find out where that weak area is and i'm telling you that's generally where it is and then from an instruction standpoint See the longest possible swing you could make. And I believe right now, if we're on the same wavelength, we're talking about those short shots we need. James Seekman says it the best. The best players in the world are trying to be as weak as humanly possible when they get very close to the green. They're not trying to add speed. They're not trying to add strength. They're not trying to add anything crazy and put a whole bunch of zip on that ball. What you said earlier, they want to lob that ball towards the green and let gravity and the roll take care of itself. Yes, there are times that you have to hit a crazy shot. And yes, those are skills that are higher end that you might want to go practice. But find the swing that might look a little bit like a longer chip swing. And Fred, if I said right now and you and I went out there and I said, OK, can you show me a little longer swing for this shot? And you would go, I don't feel comfortable doing that. That's your key to go. You got to move up a club mm. when your swing for your short game gets. I don't feel too comfortable about it. Go up a notch. Go up to the next club. Even if it's your pitching wedge, open the face a little bit and try and see how long you can recreate. You can open your nine iron. You know, there's there's no rules out there, but if you've got that great little chipping swing and you're like, this is money, I could do this all day long, find out how many clubs you could do it with. 
And if you have a sticking area, look to the club, check your ego, make your technique one that mimics that comfort you have if you're five yards from the green to go, I can chip this. And then you're, on, then you're off and running. Well, you know, when you say check your ego at the door, it also, you know, if I have a club, if I have a set of clubs that, you know, that I was fitted for and they're all working for me and I feel good, except I'm just struggling with my six iron because it's the only one that's really kind of flailing off to the right when I hit it. And I'm not sure. Then all of a sudden it's in my head that my six, I'm allergic to my six iron. So I avoid it at all costs. But again, that's part of checking your ego at the door, isn't it? Isn't that just, you actually can hit your six iron. You've convinced yourself you can't. Yes, and the truth of that matter is, and I have seen it happen from being out there on the tours for however many years, and I'm talking about the best players in the world, folks, and they measure, and I'm going to leave any names out, and I'm going to leave companies out because everyone tries their hardest. But don't be surprised, and I've seen it happen on tour, I don't know how many times, you know, they get their new set in, they're measured, they're whatever, they run over to the equipment van and they go, can you check my six, seven, and eight iron? And Paul comes out from the equipment van and he goes, well, your six and eight are pretty nice. That seven, I think that's actually built for Minute Ball because it's about two <laughs> inches over standard and about seven degrees upright. And they hear they've been struggling. My, my point of that is this. After you get a set of clubs fixed, check them. And if you don't check them, you're going to find the one that's just off a little bit. And sometimes it's lie angle. Sometimes it could be the shaft flex. They're not doing this on purpose. But I can, I can tell you a specific example. One day with a player and one of the club reps came by and said, hey, do you have a backup for your gamer here? And she said, no, actually, I've been meaning to ask you. I need a backup. Perfect. In our digital age, took out the iPhone, took a picture of the head, took a picture of the setting, took a picture of the shaft, took a picture of the grip. Next day, out comes the box on the tee, says, hey, here's your, here's your backup for your gamer in case you ever need one, you know, meaning did it get ruined in travel or, you know, if it's your favorite driver. Uh, and I remember she looked and had her caddy open and she said, well, how does it look? And he said, they got the head cover and the grip right. Oh, no. <laughs> Different shaft, completely different head, different settings, and this came out of the tour department. Oh my! And it's so, so it's and it, I'm I'm not faulting. Now look at those guys are working 24 hours a day, and but at the same point, the onus is on the player to make sure that those clubs are fit for you. <laughs> and it was true. The head cover, everything else. I mean, it's like wow, they sent in pictures of this. How did they not get that? You know, maybe it went into the wrong box or whatever. But so yeah, I mean. Even if your clubs are fit for you, with the wedges, you start looking at some of the some of the Stan Utley's and the Mike Shannon's, who's a putting and a short game guy, and of course you got Siegman. A lot of those guys, they like to start flattening the wedges out so you can do a few more things with it. Like what? As the designs of the wedges change, well, you know, they in, in terms of flattening it out, they kind of affect the lie angle. And I would say about four or five years ago, they kind of get it. So it's kind of the easiest way to describe to the average player, what is flattening out your wedge? It's like when you really hunker down in the bunker and then you're kind of laying the grip as low as you can so that you can do some things with the club. And now with some of the changes in sole design, look at the players by the green and they look like, if you ever remember in our heyday, Ray Floyd, Floyd looked like he was standing right on top of the ball when he chipped. Look at the guys now. Now they're starting to get back on top of the ball. It has so much to do with the way that club is designed, with the way the grasses are around the green. It's, that's the great thing about golf, as we talked about earlier. It's an ever-evolving sport that there are some basics that keep working. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've heard. Uh, I regularly talk about Ray Floyd in the sense that some days I'm out there, I'm playing Ray Ray golf. You know about Ray Ray golf? <laughs> Tell me what Ray Ray golf is. Uh, this hole, I'm Ray Floyd. The other hole, I'm Ray Charles. We'll be right back. <laughs> so as we continue to talk about working on your weaknesses, tell me, this is really off the wall on this one, but give me some ideas, some tips, some insights 
to know that I'm working with the wrong teacher. And that, don't mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> if, his, if his first name is Joe and his last name rhymes with mallet, shallot, or any of those close, <laughs> you, 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 you got a 50-50 chance. <laughs> That's why you he's know? been only on the show twice in 738 <laughs> episodes. <laughs> no, no, just kidding. I'm so glad to have you back. But what are, what are your thoughts about that? You know, there's there's a few things. And one is, you know, teaching, uh, I, I want to say there's a great saying by Butch Harmon. And he says, I don't teach golf. I teach people. Mm. And with Butch, it's very important about the personal relationship. So honestly, it's got to be one where the first thing that's the most important Are you on the same wavelength? Do you communicate the same way? Do you want an instructor who's more serious? Do you want an instructor who's more technical? Do you want an instructor who's maybe easygoing and going, you know, come on, let's take little steps at a time. So first of all is the personality. And, you know, I've, I've had the pleasure of working with some of the top players in the world on the LPGA. And there are other players that I've had a chance to work with and the personalities don't clash properly. And there's nothing wrong with that. So if you go to a respected professional and you're like, I I just don't feel like we're on the same wavelength, you're probably not with the right person. And secondly, I mean, you know, again, how do I know? It doesn't mean that they're bad. It's that's going to slow down your learning. It's not going to impede your learning. But if someone comes out and they're talking literally about the perceptual focal angle and that it's on the A plane and your gamma force is too low and you don't understand that, it doesn't mean he's a bad instructor and it doesn't mean you're a bad student. It's just you either have to put the effort in to learn a little bit of that lingo or the technical or they have to be able to work out together. So personality is one. Communicating on the same wavelength is two. The other key is ask people who have taken lessons from that particular instructor, people you may know, or people who referred you. Be a little wary if everyone is getting the same golf lesson. Mm. Because if everybody is okay, I'm, I'm at waist high, the club has to be here. and Somehow I can't get the club just, just inside my ear. It's always outside my shoulder. You know, trying to fit into a perfect swing model is a little bit scary. A friend of mine, Kevin Walker, who's down here in Nashville, he's a top 100 instructor, told a great story about how Jim McClain used to train some of his staff. And he said, if Bruce Litsky, now we're, we're a generation older, if Bruce Litsky came to you and you watched this man hit a 45-yard slice with every club in his bag, specifically his driver, and he hit the same shot every time and you had no idea who he was, would you fix him? And, you know, because the swing was a little different, Jim Furyk, would you fix that swing? So part of the essence of are you with a right instructor is an instructor who goes, you know, you got kind of your own way of doing this. Let's let's hit some different shots. I'd like to see what you do. And you know what? Maybe if he has you hit eight out of nine different shots, can you hit it high? Can you hit it low? Show me a fade. Show me a hook. Show me a punch shot. Show me a soft shot. If you can do pretty much all of those, a good instructor is going to go, I like what you got. What's the shot that really struggles? You know, that, what's the one that really kind of is your struggle? And he, you may say this and I go, well, why don't we learn how to just hit that shot instead of changing your whole swing? So now when you have that shot, we'll make a little modification in your setup. Maybe we might change the grip for fun on that. But how often do you have that shot? Well, I try to never have it because I'm bad at it. So you don't need an overhaul and you don't need to have the same lesson that everybody is getting unless that's what your desire is. And there's nothing wrong with that. If you go, man, oh man, I want to learn to swing the club like Ernie Els. Then you probably need to see the guy who worked with Ernie Els and you need to do it that way. Does that improve your performance? Maybe, maybe not. But if that's your goal, then you're doing the right thing. There's a difference between the way you're doing it and what you're getting out of it. And as long Mm -hmm. as your instructor is aware of both of those, he's a good instructor or she's a good instructor. Thank you. Wow. And um, is it necessary to worry about their feelings? 
If you're, if you're coming up with this going, you know what? This is the wrong person for me to be learning from, but I'm paying them. I mean, this isn't a gift. This isn't mandatory. I'm paying this, but I need to change. I need to make a change. Are they going to be okay with that? How do you do that without, you know, rustling feathers? Do I have to worry about that? No, honestly, I don't think that you do because on the other end of it, I think the instructor also realizes that there's a little communication. Now, if you just go and you send something back to the instructor and go, boy, I paid you a lot of money. I'm getting worse. That's the worst lesson I've ever had. You know, a good instructor is going to well, kind of go, well, why don't you come back out and let's take a look at this? And that's usually going to be on the instructor for that one. Right. But anytime you take lessons, at least this is my personal experience. The times that I went out and go, like, I need a lesson right now. I do it at the stupidest time. I do it when I'm playing really well going, oh, now I can get better. And every time I've done it, it screwed me up for at least six months. I mean, when you start taking lessons and you start working on different things and changing the way you do it, you're not going to get immediate results, are you? No. Okay, no, good. unless Thank it's you. really uh, unless it's really something simple. And that's that would be maybe our fifth little, uh, you know, bullet point of, you know, wh- how do you know you're with a good instructor? He or she is giving you just enough that it's not going to commiserate all the way through your swing. So you might think, you know, let's let's change this in your stance. Let's narrow your feet and let's stand a little taller at a dress. And you go, okay, okay, I got that. I got that. Now, now, now what can we do now? Because we're those type of students that kind of go, okay, okay, and I got that and I got that and I got that. A good instructor is one who's going to kind of go, why don't we accomplish this? Let's get a couple practice sessions in. Tell me what the ball's doing, and then we'll add on part two. But we're as bad as students because we want to tackle it all at once. I, I will honestly, I remember I, I did a corporate event a few years ago with Stacy Lewis, and one of the ladies said, "What are you working on?" <laughs> she said, "This right here." And she took the club back. Oh, I don't know, about fourteen, twenty inches. And she goes, "What's that?" She goes, "That's an important part of the golf swing." She goes, "And uh, we've been working on it for about three months." And she goes, it isn't, it isn't that I don't know how to do it. I have to be able to rely on what the ball's doing if I don't hit it good. And she goes, so when you go and you work with your pro and you're like, okay, I want to learn. I need a better turn. I need to learn how to drive my legs. I want to learn this late release and turning the club down. She goes, just pick one thing and yeah. work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and try to avoid confusion. I would get, you know, it's like, is this the kind of thing? thing that you've just been taught that you can go to the driving range in three days or four days because you you know not everyone has the option of going out every single day to practice but if you can go out to the driving range if you get your lesson on a saturday can you go out on wednesday for an hour and remember what they taught you without being confused about no wait was i supposed to put my hands down here or you know you kind of get lost there that is, and you know what, you, you want to talk about uh, really good instructors, they always have what they call your, your three things or your top three. First of all, they almost notoriously will make sure that two of them are involved in your setup. Mm-hmm. And that could be a posture issue. It could be an alignment issue. And if they put something in the swing, generally it's going to be in the back swing so that you've got an idea of getting the club started on a proper path. But it, literally three in swing things that you would get from an instructor doesn't mean he's a bad instructor. Or she's a bad instructor. You as the student got to go, ooh, ooh, ooh. the swing takes 1.3 yeah. seconds and I'm trying to do three things. Get, what's the most important one of these? Or let's focus on this. And I'm going to have you do this goofy little drill where you stand on one leg and hit some wedges. I'll tell you why we do it the next lesson. Your pro isn't keeping stuff from you. Right. A good pro is literally giving you what to work on. He'll give you a drill of some kind. And what you don't realize is that will help get you to the next part of where you guys are going Uh, on your journey. Okay. But don't feel afraid to, don't be afraid to take control. I mean, it's their lesson to you, but you're paying for it. So you should be able to say no. And I've never met a professional that doesn't say that was a great lesson. This John came up. Susan came up and they know exactly what they want to work on. Yeah. And it was so easy for us to kind of get that accomplished. And generally you end up with a lot of time over to go, what do you say we learned to hit a ball out of a fairway bunker? Let's try that. Yeah. 
instead of kind of hunting and pecking around there. So that is really, really, I mean, that, that's a dream for an instructor. It really is. Awesome. This has been amazing. Thank you for coming back. I'm so glad that we found each other because I'm going to keep dragging you in here. Uh, how can people get in touch with you? How do they find you? Uh, do you have your own website, sir? I do have my own website, Joe Hallett Golf. And actually, we actually launched an app a little while ago. It's the Joe Hallett app where you get a little, what, what do we, we kind of throw a newsletter in there every couple of weeks. And what do we call it? Uh, birdies, bogeys, and bo- bo- baloney. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what can make you better? What can make you a little bit less worse? And, uh, you know, what's some of the other stuff out there that might not be, uh, you know, what's the smartest stuff to go chase after right now? Okay, so there's the Joe Hallett app, and it's yep. H A. L-L-E-T-T. You got it. Okay. That is so exactly what it is. And uh, Joe Hallett Golf, H-A-L-L-E-T-T, Joe Hallett Golf, J-O-E, dot com. Where are you teaching these days? I'm still based in uh, just outside of Nashville, Tennessee at the Legends Club. And uh, it's been, if when I'm not here, I'm out in the LPGA. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, those... Those ladies and those guys are so anxious to get out on a golf course. And you want to talk about something that's difficult. It's very difficult to practice when you're not sure the next time you're going to tee it up is. Right. And, it's, and so a lot of the practice things we've been doing are little challenges. At the end of the week, let's see if we can get this. At the end of the week, let's see if we can get that. And a lot of them are using indoor simulators and virtual golf just to kind of test some of those practices and those shots out. So it's... It's, uh, you know, they've become a lot more resourceful in because of this, but I think they've also opened up things for themselves that are, you know, there are some other ways to practice and there are other ways and maybe more efficient ways that I can get things done a little bit quicker. So that's, that's really good for them because time is of the essence for anybody out there on the tour. Joe, thank you so much for coming back on and sharing your vast wisdom. I really appreciate it. And uh, tell everyone again, joehalletgolf.com. Joe, thanks so much. Fred, I appreciate what you do for the game. And I really enjoy talking to you. And let's not make it six and a half years anymore. All right. <laughs> or 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So as we approach the beginning of May, and even in the last few days, more courses across the United States are opening again. Great news. Courses in Washington, Illinois, and Pennsylvania will be opening this Friday. And here in California, it's interesting, it's still a local decision as to whether or not a course will open. But currently, more than 70% of the Golf Now Partner courses in California are still closed. So... California is doing everything we can to, you know, flatten the curve, and we seem to be succeeding. So, uh, you know, I'll post the map that Golf Now updates on this episode's uh, blog post at golfsmarter.com, and you can check that map out for yourself and see what's going on for you locally. I mentioned last week that I was planning on driving 90 miles to Sacramento to go play this Thursday, but the course that we played on our last round in late March... <laughs> can't believe I've not played in that long. Uh, Eagle Vines in Napa Valley has reopened with some caveats, of course, only two players per tee time, walking only, and the cups are turned upside down. So it's only about 35 miles. So I'm headed out there and I'm very excited to play again. And I, <laughs> I know my mood will improve once I finish 18 holes. What about you? Have you been playing? Are the courses open or closed by you? And if you're not able to play, how are you practicing? I'd love to hear more about that. Uh, hopefully you came to golfsmarter.com to register for that brand new pair of Squares golf shoes valued at $200. And there's still a discount available. Check out golfsmarter.com and look at the uh, entry. We still have that listed as what their discount is. So you might want to check it out if you didn't win them, because um, I will announce that winner. You know, the prize includes a pair of Squares golf shoes, a Squares hat, some Squares socks with the squared off toe. I just love that. 
and a little handy carrying bag. And we added Caddy Daddy's Claude breathable gloves as well. So congratulations are headed towards Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when their courses are opening this Friday. So Kelly Riggle, it's you. You're going to get some new shoes and a new glove to go out and play again. Thanks so much for your participation, Kelly. I'll send you an email and a copy, and I'll copy the folks over at Squares and Caddy Daddy Golf so that you can provide the details to get your new shoes and your new glove and speak with them directly. Our next giveaway is another that I'm confident you're going to want in your bag. It's a brand new 257 Plus hybrid with Turf Glider Soul Technology from Knuth Golf. Deadline to enter is Sunday, May 10, at midnight Pacific time, 3 a.m. Eastern. When you register, you'll also find links to Knuth Golf with a coupon code for 25% off your purchase for either a hybrid, a metal fairway, or a driver, or all of them. And that's courtesy of the Pope of Slope, our old friend, Dean Knuth. Again, enter before May 10, 2020 at golfsmarter.com slash giveaway2020 or simply just go to golfsmarter.com and click on the banner at the top of the page and you'll see enter here. This week on Golf Smarter Mulligans, uh, we go back to 2008. Great conversation with Director of Golf Instruction at Pinehurst Resort, Eric Alpenfels, on his book Instinct Putting. I'm happy to report that Eric is still at Pinehurst. Why would you want to leave there? And his book is available as well. Here's a taste from this week's episode, which will be published this Friday as episode 54 with Eric Alpenfels on Instinct Putting. Over time, we saw a pattern that if the golfer was looking at the hole, whether they were doing it in a practice stroke or eventually we had them practice distance control putts, uh, while they're looking at the hole, it just seemed to be more effective. Now, it, it it's, you know certainly makes sense that if I'm going to th- throw a a football, I'm looking at the the maybe the the tight end who's running across the field to throw it to, versus looking at the football while I'm throwing it. So, a lot of common sense with the idea of why it would make sense to look at the hole, get a sense of the amount of stroke that's necessary to get the ball to the hole, and uh, as we are showing in the book that. You know, for some people, the technique of actually looking at the hole while they putt for distance putts or and even relatively short putts is uh, pretty effective. That's Golf Smarter Mulligans, episode number 54. It'll be out this Friday. It's our sister podcast from the archives of 400 plus hours of Golf Smarter called Golf Smarter Mulligans. And you can find it wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Golf Smarter. Read more about our weekly content on LinkedIn. Or if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions you want to get in touch with me, just click on the Hey Fred button at golfsmarter.com.